Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we now we are kind of settled for a model. The next step now is to use these two forecasts actually to try to find values for future time points after 2001. So let's try to forecast the 2002 season based on this model. Okay, that's uh, the next step. Uh, I'll show you how, how we'll do this. Then after that we will kind of look at a slightly different method for doing it. Uh, which we will explain in due time. <coughs> when we do regression forecasting, it's kind of obvious, isn't it, that to kind of produce values in the future for a given point in time, you need typically to forecast all the variables in the model as at least as long as the variable are kind of timed together. So if I have weather, for instance, as a variable in my model, and I'm looking forward to the next home match, which, which is in close to 14 days, then I need to forecast the weather on a 12, 13 days horizon, which is not easy. Okay. And this is not all. Okay, I have to forecast perhaps, uh, I know perhaps the opponent, but if it's about pricing, then I have to forecast the price policy and all this kind of stuff. And that could be very difficult. So in general, the main problem when it comes to forecast accuracy, when it comes to regression modeling, is that you, you, you may have problems because you need to forecast a lot of these x variables. Some of them may be easy, but some of them may be very hard. And in general, as it says here, many axes lead to a high aggregated variance or forecast uncertainty. There is some mathematical theorems here, which says that if you kind of add uncertainty together, then it kind of increases progressively. So what you actually do here then is, is actually adding uncertain variables together, and then if, it's, if you're uncertain on, on some of them, then you kind of get a bigger uncertainty on your output or your forecast by the fact that you're uncertain on your kind of input variables here. This is perhaps the main reason why time series methods often are applied. Let's think about a very simple example. Okay, let's think about forecasting the weather. You've probably seen on these weather forecasts that they forecast the temperature. Okay, because this temperature must be timed. Okay, it could be an average temperature, a maximal temperature, a temperature at four o'clock or whatever. But they need to forecast this. One day ahead, two day ahead, three day ahead, uh, up to five days ahead if they have a five five day forecast. Sometimes some, some stations may even have a 10-day forecast. Of course it gets very uncertain. Now if you know something about how weather forecasting is done, you probably know that they, they, they use very advanced mathematical models. They have these coupled differential e equations which kind of should describe how these low pressures move, the high pressures move, and based on these models then they kind of come up with predictions on when for instance a certain storm should apply. And of course they also have similar models that kind of tells you the temperature. So the temperatures you see on a weather forecast map on TV are based on these kind of thoughts, okay, which seems sensible. On the other hand, you could do this very easily, couldn't you? You could just say that tomorrow's temperature is the same as today. That would be a time series approach, wouldn't it? Then you would just use the previous observation to forecast the next one. And, and I would guess that uh, that model perhaps would produce just as good temperature forecasts as the actual models. But of course, forecasting of a weather is a bit more serious than temperatures. It's about storms and rain and a lot of stuff, okay? So, but the point is that when it comes to kind of operative forecasts, which you kind of should use uh, as input to logistics planning, then it, it you get a reasonably good accuracy with time series model. Uh, and this accuracy is in many cases good enough. So if you are to try a simple conclusion here, you could perhaps say that using regression models with the only aim of forecasting is perhaps not so good. On the other hand, when we deal with events, we have time, and we may have additional information, as we saw last time with this special, special um, 
play of UNESCO. As you probably, if you did read the local newspaper today, which you, some of you probably didn't, as you're not so strong in Norwegian, <laughs> uh, there was actually. Um, a link to a new Nesby play. Uh, if I let me see what it says. Just as an apropos to, to yesterday's discussion. I think I put up a link here, didn't I? Uh, let's see. Aha. Uh -huh. You see, here is a link. An article in today's paper. Or if I put this one on top here. Aha! Uh -huh. That didn't work. Let me try again. Copy. Mm, yeah. You can probably see the word Nespe. So, so there is a new play. Not by the local theater, but, but, but with this Oslo theater who travels around, Riks Theater, just like Riks concerts, this kind of th thing we discussed yesterday. And it says here that um, uh, originally this uh, theater should only have a single uh, play with this uh, play called Doctor Proctor in Molde, which was on Thursday, the 26th of September. Uh, the great interest uh, led, uh, however, uh, to an open sale of the what is this called in English? What, what is it called when you have um, this test you have before the premiere in English? Yeah, you know, before you have the, the first play, you have a kind of test before. It has a certain name in Norwegian at least. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean, okay? This, this is kind of sold out here as, 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 as a stay, and they, they also have actually put up two more. So instead of the plan one, it turns out to be four. Which of course tells us again that when you know that there will be a kind of play with this, this author, then the demand will boost, just as we saw on the theater board example yesterday. Okay, this was a sidestep. So finally, here, of course, this argument or this kind of aggregated uncertainty when you have to forecast many variables kind of has a bad impact on the quality of the forecast. On the other hand, What's nice with these regression models is that there is this kind of explanation here. So if you want to test, let's try another price policy, then you can do that and see what the, the model tells you. Which of course you cannot do with a time series model, okay? Because you don't have the variables in the model. So this what if thinking is interesting to look at when you do regression analysis, because you can actually do it then. Then you can test changing policies. And if there are certain variables which are decision variables for you, typically pricing would be that, then you can see the effect through this kind of model by saying, okay, let's half the prices, what will happen? Okay. Of course, in this case, maybe not would much would happen because most of what explains it here is kind of not affected by the prices. So, uh, but, uh, but uh, th this could and should differ between different clubs. Okay, now let's look at our model in the sense on what variables do we have to forecast, okay? Uh, the form of MFK, of course, if we stand today, we know the three last matches. So we can find our prediction for the next match. If we move one more ma match ahead, of course, then we know, don't know uh, the, the match tomorrow, which will be one of the, the three lost. If we move one more, there's two missing. Even one, there is three missing, okay? So uh, we have a problem with this one when it comes to forecasting, if we're interested in finding more than one or two or three matches ahead. So if you want to forecast the whole season, then we might have troubles finding a sensible way of, of fortune telling what form Molde would be. Of course, that's uh, what interests everybody. If we knew that, we didn't have to watch, go to the match. But, uh, but that's kind of it. On the other hand, these other four, we can actually forecast those with 100% accuracy, can't we? Because when we will play Arbeco is given Actually, by Christmas, we know the schedule. So half a year before the season starts, or at least three or four months, we know at what time RBK will be the home opponent. 
The same, at the same point, we know what match and if there will be a match on the 16th of May in Molde. We know also which team they will play against. The stadium, of course, we know. Unless there is severe plans on making changes, it's, it remains as it has been, as it is now. And the same with this jazz match. We know if there will be a home match in this jazz week, because we know when the jazz festival is typically half a year before, as long as, as, as we know the schedule. So, in this case, there is only one variable, actually, which is kind of uncertain, bringing uncertainty into our predictions. The other ones are, are certain. We, don't, we, we do not have problems forecasting the four last variables there. And that is, of course, important. So what's remaining then, basically, to produce these forecasts is to, uh, is to know the schedule. And of course, we, today, of course, we know the schedule for 2002. But the point is that when we finish these year's seasons and uh, two weeks before Christmas, we have a new schedule. So we know then what uh, the information for the next year, if, if you are interested in to use this model to forecast for 2014. But we need to do something with this form variable. And uh, if you look at the table at the bottom here, uh, I have looked at the end point for Molde. You see they got 47 points in 95, they got 33 points, a bad season in 96, 45 in 97, 54 in 98, 50 in 99. If you remember, of course, they played Champions League here. So this, this had to be a good season. Actually, they didn't win. They ended up second. But in, in those days, Norway was so high ranked on the FIFA ranking that we actually had two teams able to qualify for the Champions League. Then a bad year in zero, another bad, not so bad in... in, in, in. And if you just uh, compute the number of points per match here, you see that it's 1.8 here, 1 1.3, 1.7, 2.1, 1.9, 1.5, and 1.7. And to do it very simple then, I just use a kind of uh, uh, value here. So I could uh, make a three match prediction by just multiplying this value by three, okay? So either I can do a full average here. If I do a full average, adding all these numbers together, dividing by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I get 1.7, it turns out. I might as well use this one then. That's also 1.7. So 1.7 seems like a reasonable prediction for Molde in this period. The last two, two seasons, Molde has taken around 2.0 points per, per, per year. So the, 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 the shift from 1.7 up to 2.0 is really big in football. Okay? If you're able to take two points a match, that basically means that you win all home matches and draw all away matches, because then you get four points or two matches, two points a match. So that is normally enough to win most leagues in Europe. So this is a kind of a very easy target for coaches, okay? We are trying to get two points on average per match. So, uh, but 1.7 is... Um, then you might actually be relegated in Norway, okay? So, th so this very tiny distance of 0 0.3 points could actually make a great difference. <coughs> You see here in 98, they got 2.1. As I said, they didn't win. They actually, they got more points in this season than they had in the two last seasons when they won. But the point is, of course, that Rosenberg was so good this year. They had 2.3 or 2.4. So uh, it wasn't enough. And even here was a good season. Both these two seasons were good. The other ones are kind of down on 1.6, 1.7, that area. So a very simple way of making a prediction for a whole season is just taking a kind of rough point average and multiply this point average bid 3 to produce the 3.3 game value we need for our variable. So then let's look at the, the final parts. Uh, these are uh, relatively very easy. When the match schedule is known, normally long before season, we know the values of the 16th of May, the Jazz and the RBK variables. You probably remember that this Brann variable was not significant, so we don't include, didn't include that. Now it turns out that in 2002, the 16th of May is a home match played against Moss, which is of course no a much, mm, much worse team. It's actually not in the Tippe Liga, it's at the bottom of the second division actually. So it's kind of moved two steps down since 2002. The seventh match 
is also a home match in the Jazz Festival and they play at home against Rosenborg in 2002 as the ninth home match. So then we have the values for all these. And of course the stadium variable is known, it's zero up. So it's one for all these matches. Then it's straightforward to forecast here, isn't it? The constant of the model was 2798.85. That is always there, okay? It seems like a more sensible number than the first one, which was close to 5000. On the other hand, if you look at the last three seasons, Molde has actually sold more than 5000 season cards. So you know that more than 5000 tickets are sold. So in general, today this number is much, much higher. Maybe up to at least twice that number. The stadium is new and it continues to be new, uh, so we just add the stadium value to produce 5793.95. Yeah, I, I seem to have included the average point per match here. Not So I, I look at three matches, but I calculate the average per match in these three matches, okay? So it's not it's not three times this, it's just, just the average point per match. So uh, then I can add the MFK form, which is 1.7 times this coefficient from the regression model for the form variable. This produces a given number, which is the kind of base forecast. All matches which are not on the 16th of May, not against Rosenborg, or not in the Jazz Week, will produce these forecasts now. Okay, that is all these matches. So we can end up now by, by, by adding some numbers here. We have to add the, the 16th of May value to the most match, producing 8462 as the final prediction. We add the Rosenborg coefficient for the RBK match, which was match 9 producing a total of 11,758 spectators. And finally we add this Jazz Week match, which was against was match 7 against Odd. So then we get a, a forecast of 7,868. So you see this is a quite a simple forecast model. We have a kind of base forecast here, which is unchanged on most matches, but we add a little bit on top here to kind of cover for the fact that the these effects turned out to be significant. Actually, this is, is, is not such a bad forecast. This is kind of what it looks like if you compare it to the actual values, which of course are on the right here. Okay, this is the real values. You see there is a really big mistake here. Okay, we, we kind of over forecast the value here. And this is kind of special, isn't it? Because normally it should be more on this 16th of May match, and it's actually less than around it. So probably the weather was very bad on that date, okay? Of course, uh, we could test that. You could try to find it out. What was the weather in Molde on the 16th of May in 2002? Uh, you can try to find it out, okay? There will be a home uh, work for you until next time. I would expect it to be very bad, okay? We will see. Of course, Moss is not a good opponent. It's a, it's a very bad team and it was bad that in those days as well, so that could also have some impact. Alternatively, the weather could be very nice. 16th of May is the day before the National Day. People could travel, whatever, okay? So there's a lot of potential explanations here. But if you really look at it, you see it, it doesn't really look so bad. It's kind of, uh, of course, uh, these forecasts are not based on any information on the 2002 season. So we, we, this is a real comparison, okay? It's kind of as if we stood at the start of 2002, what information did we have? And we used that information to produce this uh, blue line and uh, compare it to the red line. You also see that, that we have a, a reasonably good forecast on what actually did happen in the RBK match. You see we forecasted 11,007 we got 11,001, so it's just a difference of 600 spectators, okay, so it, uh, it fits kind of nicely. <coughs> of course, if, if you are to use this kind of model in decision support, then it doesn't have much value, does it? Because what it tells you 
is that Molde should ideally play all their matches on the 16th of May. The Jazz Festival should be in that week. They should play all their matches against RBK. And uh, they should always be in maximal form. Okay? You knew that already, didn't you? So that, that doesn't really help you in decision support. Other teams that does this kind of analysis, they would probably include more other variables that could be relevant for decision support. Because decision support variables here would, would, would need a situation uh, where, where, where there is actual decision variables for you in the model. Typically pricing, marketing would be that. Okay? You can decide what to do. Of course, in the long run, uh, much or most of the decisions you make sport-wise would be to try to improve your form in any way. You would try to win more matches. The more matches you win, the, the larger this form variable would be, of course, and then you, then you would add to it. But uh, Molde is a peculiar city. If you do the same kind of analysis in Oslo or Bergen, you get a totally different model. It wouldn't look like this at all. So this is, of course, important learning. If you want to do this, you really need to, you really need to do it. You cannot uh, kind of rely on other people doing similar stuff because uh, the local variations here are extreme. Now we see here typically that Molde is a team which have very faithful supporters. They, kind of, they show up, and they show up especially for certain matches. If they play against, against those from Trøndelag, then everybody comes. And it doesn't matter so much who else they play. That's not so important. How they are on the table is not so important. The form is slightly important, but not very much. If you look at the numbers here, you see that the form variable here kind of accounts for less than 700 spectators. You see these numbers? Much, much larger. Okay. So even if the form plays some part here, it doesn't really play an important part. Okay. Okay, let's move to another topic. And what we did now was kind of a long term forecast. We produced many forecasts long into the future. And in many instances, this is interesting. Okay, you may need some kind of a rough estimate on the total number of spectators. Maybe you need to check out various ticketing systems. And so, all these, these kind of information is interesting in some logistic planning areas. But it could be that uh, you have a kind of decision space here which allows you for making what I call short-term or dynamic updates on the forecasts in this case. Because uh, we know that the normal length in time between home matches is 14 days. Okay? There is some exceptions. There may be some European matches, there may be some cup, cup matches, and there may, may be some special time of the year matches, like the 16th of May, for instance, You're not, of course, necessarily is uh, hooked on to a weekend. And there is certain parts of the season which are kind of condensed. So there are certain limited parts of the season where we play two matches a week, Wednesday, Sunday, so on. So there is some exception, but, but roughly you kind of have a planning horizon here on 14 days. So when you have played a home match, then there's typically 14 days to the next home match. And there may be decisions in this period which are important to, to, to take. For instance, how much to order all different kind of food or drinks and that kind of stuff. Uh, make plans for entertainment, all these kind of stuff could typically be made within this kind of time frame. And then, of course, if you can produce better forecasts then for the next match, that could be of interest. And if you just look one match ahead, then, of course, we can understand that this form variable is available. Okay? If we are just looking for the next home match, then we have the form variable perfectly, don't we? Because then we know immediately after the last home match, we know the, that match, we know the, the second last and the third last home match. So we have that average point per, per these three matches, and we can input that into the next period forecast. So we can kind of reduce the uncertainty of this form variable, which we simply put to 1.7 for the whole next period to produce better forecasts. Okay? You understand? So as long as we don't have to make plans any longer than the next match, we can hopefully improve our forecasts by getting a better value on the form variable.
this would be the case for most of the variables which are not included in these analyses as well because you must remember that most other teams would typically have significance in all many of these grayed out variables the opponent's position is of course available Again, you see this position on the table is hard to forecast, isn't it? You know it now, but when there is three matches ahead, you don't know what position you are. So you have to forecast it, okay? So again, you can utilize the fact that you, you can just look for a, a single period forecast to get a better value on these ones. The opponents form, of course, the same as, as this uh, form of the, 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 the molde itself. No, it's, it's there. So this, this, I think, is the opponent's three last matches, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't remember this one, but it's, uh, it's there, I think. Explained. So, so the point is actually... Oh, wrong way. The point is straightforward. If we can kind of settle for a short-term forecast, we should expect better forecasts, okay? That is the idea. So this is kind of an attempt to try to improve the forecasts we already have built by looking at one match at a time. So now we kind of simulate that we move from step to step and check to produce new forecasts because I know the form for the last three matches for each of these future matches, okay? Of course, uh, uh, we cannot do this now. Of course, now we can find the forecast for the next match because we know we know the three last home matches. Home mode has performed there. So, uh, but we cannot do it for another round again, because then we, we need this next one. So this is a full kind of uh, screen of what actually did happen in the 2002 season. Uh, they won their first home match, and I have calculated this, this uh, value, which is the three last home points, divided by three. Uh, then there's a draw away and they win the home match again. Of course, then this, this variable is increasing. Okay, we had another victory, so we get 167. Then there's a draw in five, so it goes down again. So we kind of include this one, it seems, in the calculation. Then there's a win. Yeah, there was a... Yeah, so it sticks here and... Uh, now you see the number of wins increase here. When there's three wins, so then you get to three here, three here. And you start uh, getting a, a single point again, and, and so on. So, so these values are kind of calculated based on what did actually happen. And of course, we need the, the three previous home matches from the, the 2001 season as well to, to make this run. So you just add them together and divide by three. And then, of course, uh, we get a kind of change now, because now the form variable changes over time. And so we get a different form variable in most future time match periods uh, and uh, if you look at the equation here the idea is that it should kind of represent what's happening here of course this component here is the same so for all matches which do not include, include match 8, 15 and 19 which are the kind of correspondence to the numbers you saw in the previous table of course now they are changing because now we number the matches away matches as well okay so this corresponds to the 16th of May, this corresponds to the RBK perhaps, or you know, you know the drill, I don't remember, okay, so the, this, these three kind of separation, se separate cases. So we have this base forecast and then we have to, to multiply with these different form variables and uh, we also have to add these three, this is the RBK, this is the this is the jazz and this is the 16th of May. That's, that's how it is, okay? So then we just enter these numbers here in, instead of this one to produce, should we say, a slightly more different set of forecasts. So now you see that uh, we don't really get also equal numbers anymore. Uh, 6427, 6589, 64, that, that those two are equal, and then suddenly 82, it's 72, and so it, it kind of changes more, obviously, as the form variable changes. Again, we can now kind of compare, can't we, and see what's happening here. Um, 
The blue forecast was our original forecast, the long-term forecast, LT. And then we have the actual attendance, the red curve, as before, and then we just superimpose the blue one here. You see that the change is perhaps, no, sorry, the green one. The change is not very big, it's kind of close here, but here something happens, okay? We kind of get slightly closer to the red curve here, but here we get sl slightly more away from it. Slightly closer here, but more away here. So it kind of goes a bit, little bit up and a little bit down here, okay? It's, uh, it's not such that, uh, that we need to get improvement. The point, of course, here is that in the long run, you should get improvement by this strategy. But for a given set of observations, you can't guarantee it. And that exactly that's, that's really what's happening here. If you, yeah, I've computed the MAD here. The MAD is, uh, is the absolute difference between the forecast and the actual demand, okay? So instead of squaring, I just take the difference and remove all the signs. And you see here that uh, the long-term forecast is worse for the brand, brand match, G98. So it improves here in the start. It's slightly better here in the second match. Much better here in the third match. Still better here in the fourth match. Then it's worse in the fifth. It's better again against Tobacco here. It's worse again here. Better here. Worse there against there. Then it's much worse there as compared to there. And worse there again. So we see it seems to be better in the start and worse in the end. As I said, we cannot guarantee that for a cert for a kind of one point observation like this is, you cannot guarantee that doing things better logically will guarantee a better forecast. And it didn't do it in this case. Okay, the, 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 the total man is 1324 for the short term forecast and 1314 for the long term. So it's it's smaller for the actual the first one we got. So they totally are kind of producing less errors. But we would expect that if we kind of use this over a long-term horizon, uh, they should at least perform, perform better. So the, the answer to the question here, why they are not better, then the reason is, of course, that uh, we, we cannot guarantee it for a given instance. But in the long run, it, it should, should be better. Okay. Yeah. I hope you see the difference here. Okay, these long-term forecasts, they are kind of made now for a set of future periods. This short term, I kind of, I moved first, I compute for the, the, the next period. And the idea then by it is that uh, it uh, should be possible to make decisions in these periods. Okay, so then, you, then of course, you should utilize the information you actually have. Uh, instead of just using this average as we did in the long term. One. But the, the nice thing with average one is, of course, we can produce forecasts for the next year, the year after, and many years ahead <laughs> if, if we're interested in doing that. But of course, doing that is risky because you know that things may change, of course. We base our model on a set of years, okay, from 1995 to 2001. And if we step many years after that, a lot of things have changed. And uh, today there's a new coach, there are new players, there are new audience. Everything is new. So you should be careful with kind of doing very long term forecasting on any kind of data, especially perhaps on this one. But the nice thing here is that you can see that you are actually able to, to kind of hit relatively good with a limited number of variables, okay? Uh, so, so, so I think this is a, a good example, actually, that, uh, that it's possible to do things. Uh, and of course, I know that these clubs, they don't do this, okay? Yeah, they, <laughs> they, they don't need it, perhaps, but, uh, but uh, I don't know. Uh, you have been working there, Maria, haven't you? Mm -hmm. On the VIP? Uh, At the restaurant. Yeah. So you don't know whether it's a shortage, shortage of sausages or, uh, or soda, do you? Because on your part, uh, everything is there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they have big storages or champagne, if that's yes. what they get. Do you, so is there any champagne drinking in the VIP uh, areas? Wine. Most of wine, okay. Wine. So not so much champagne. Uh, Maybe only after the victories. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A few, year, a few words about pre-sales. One thing which is typical for events is pre-sales. And the main reason, of course, is that it's possible. Okay. You have time in between the events. 
There is typically 14 days between one home match and the other one. And uh, that opens up for classical pre-sales, but of course there is also an option for selling uh, tickets for more than one match, which typically would be seasonal tickets. And uh, if you compare events to normal business, whether it's services or not, uh, pre-sales are more the rule than the exception in events, and the other way around in other products. We do, however, today see a tendency or increased pre-sales on what I would call modern products. So if Apple announced a new computer, there are some people who take the risk and write their name on the list to be the first buyer of it, okay? There are certain computer games who are pre-sold. So these part of the production life seems to be pre-sold. But there is still a major difference because the consumers who kind of do this seems to be a much smaller group than the consumers who do pre-sale uh, transactions in events. Almost any consumer are kind of used to, to pre-buy tickets for events, but if you think about this computer gaming or uh, special new cars or whatever, it seems to be a kind of very special segment of the market. Do you see what I understand? It's the kind of the uh, we, we tend to call them pilot consumers, okay? Those guys who have a lot of money and want to test the new product first. Okay. But in events, it's not the pilot consumers, it's the normal consumers who are kind of doing pre-buys. While the event manager or event logistic lo logistician would do pre-sales. Uh, there are typically two situations of pre-sales. One we might call maximal pre-sold amount. And what I mean, mean by that is that you do not sell all the tickets. You decide before you sell tickets which share of the stadium you want to sell out. So you say, okay, I will keep some tickets until the match day and I will sell the other one out before if I can. So from all this case, they sell seasonal tickets first. And they say, okay, I will need to have some space left in case something special happens. I need to have some seats. Uh, so I, I, instead of selling everything, I sell uh, a part of it. And typically they might sell that to lower prices. And then they can increase the price if the demand turns out to be very high, uh, closer to the match. This is typically in sports, especially in football. So Barcelona could probably sell out new Camp, I think, in, in, all, in all matches, but they choose not to themselves, okay? So they keep some to kind of capture the late time demand changes. Of course, there's a risk involved, isn't it? If Barcelona performs very bad in a series sequence, it may, may very well happen that they are not able to sell those tickets. On the other hand, if they perform very well, then they could uh, give tickets to those who really want them. If there's important people, they could even increase prices if they would like to take more profits. So they cannot take more of the risk themselves by keeping some of the tickets. But this is typical for sports. If you think about concerts, you see quite a different situation, don't you? Because in concerts, they don't, they don't seem to bother about this, do they? They kind of sell as much as they can, and if they sell out, they're happy. Do you have an explanation for the presumably difference here between non-sport events and sport events. And this is not, by the way, not, I don't think it's general in sports events either. It seems to be most in football, but in other sports events you could sell out everything and everybody seems to be happy. I haven't found much of an explanation. A general question about pre-sales. You probably know that there will be a world championship in football in Brazil in 2014. Uh, a little bit less than a year from now, and there will be a final in Rio de Janeiro, okay? Uh, they are actually pre-selling tickets to the final now. Why are they doing that? Do you think that's the way to make most money? To have an idea how much people will attend. Uh, but you know how much people will attend, don't you? There is a stadium capacity and it will be full, won't it? Yeah. A World Cup football final in Brazil will be full. No matter what, okay? Th the general point of doing pre-sales right. 
is kind of trying to sell out as much as possible and get some information on, on, as you say. But in this case, you have that information. So why do you do it? Why do FIFA pre-sell tickets to the World, World Cup finals? There could be other arguments, couldn't it? It could be that a world championship in football should offer many people around the world the possibility of seeing the final live. In order to do that, people who live in Zambia or in India may need to plan uh, long ahead. Mm -hmm. So they may need to buy the ticket long ahead, okay? But uh, I see really no good, no good private economic reasons for doing it, so it must be something else, okay? It must be some kind of uh, argument that at least some of these tickets should be for some other countries. So you see there is a conflict here, okay, about uh, obviously be be perhaps between making most money on this or maybe uh, targeting some other objectives. But this is, has really nothing to do with this. When it comes to, to pre-sales, it opens up some options, doesn't it? For instance, it opens up black market sales, doesn't it? If you don't pre-sell, then it's very difficult to arrange black market selling. Okay, black market sales, they come up in situations where there is demand differences between two time points. There's typically a low demand initially, and then it increases at the end. So I then can, as a black market salesman, can buy tickets at, at a low price, and when I, the match day enters, I can then sell them. This is the classical situation for the World Cup final, isn't it? <coughs> there is always a queue, always excess demand, so I can always find buyers that will pay more than I bought for the ticket. So again, you see this argument of letting everybody into the World Cup final actually opens up for black market sales. So if you don't want to have black market sales, of course you can try to forbid it, which is the strategy they have tried. Alternatively, you could drop pre-sales, of course, then you you wouldn't have any black market because it would be much more tricky. The black market salesman would have to queue up like everybody else and the chance of getting the tickets are, are poor, getting to buy many are poor, typically you wouldn't be able to do that on these ticket stand outside the match. There are some other logistical arguments, isn't it, that uh, to arrange selling out 150,000 tickets on a given day, that may be difficult. Okay. There will be huge queues, a lot of fuss, security problems, so one other argument for doing pre-sales is that, okay, you can kind of, you can distribute the sale over several days to kind of avoid all this fuss with all these people at the same time. On the other hand, as I said, you get something nasty instead, for instance, black market sales. And black market sales is perhaps a much bigger enemy against fairness in selling tickets to the final than the actual fact that you allow a big pre-sales period. When it comes to other events, like t theaters and concerts, you don't see so much of this, but you see some black market activity, don't you? And again, of course, it's due to the fact that you pre-sell the tickets. So this is kind of a decision you make. You can, if you like, kill all black market activity by not pre-selling the tickets. On the other hand, you face a risk then if you don't have an extremely popular arrangement like the World Cup Finals in football, which are extremely popular, and you know that. Uh, you probably talked a little bit about bundling, when you had this event economics course with uh, Professor Solberg, I think. He, you know, bundling is that you kind of put tickets together. You say, okay, if you are to watch the World Cup finals, you have to buy two other tickets, okay, for some preliminary rounds, okay? That is bundling. You force the consumer to buy something the consumer really don't lo like because it's beneficial for you. And typically, you can have a good effect of bundling if there is a large difference in demand between sub-events. So you have something which is very popular and something which is not so popular. Okay, then you would try a bundling strategy. Okay, that then it could be beneficial. This is again a typical situation in World Cup finals in football, where there are certain matches, for instance, between Japan and South Korea, which are not so popular in Brazil. The other matches between Ar Argentina and Chile, which are extremely popular, or Mexico for that case. In, in uh, so you have these matches at the preliminary stage. Some are extremely unpopular, others are extremely popular, and you would like to kind of bundle these matches to, to secure that you fill up as many seats as possible. Of course, 
which process to take given that you do pre-sales is a problem by itself because you when you pre-sale tickets and of course that is important here this is an option in events okay you have a time period before the event when you produce cars or screws or whatever you sell them every day so you, you cannot do a lot on the dynamic side on the pricing uh, or you can actually do it but it's extremely costly to communicate it to the consumers and uh, probably you wouldn't actually earn much uh, if you kind of compare these communication costs with the, the actual potential in increasing the revenue by doing dynamic pricing but when it comes to events you can do this and of course you know that tickets are normally at least if the event is popular they are they are more in demand closer to the to the date and of course there's ex efficiently zero immediately when it starts so it, it's kind of a very short period here you have to kind of do your dynamics if you want to do it and, and dynamic pricing is something we will talk more about later on okay time for a break yeah we take a break <laughs>